She was a ship that launched a thousand legends. The RMS Titanic. In her time, the largest moving object in the world. A crown jewel in an age of confidence. And then, a glancing blow with an iceberg sent her and all that she represented to the bottom of the sea. Fifteen hundred lives were lost. Gone, too, was our boundless faith in the promise of technology. Titanic had vanished. Eighty-six years later, she is still impossible to forget. Since the ship was found, broken in two, her debris scattered across a mile of ocean floor. Hydraulics up. Scientists have been sifting through her wreckage for evidence of her final hours. Good. Sorting out truth from legend, fact from folklore. Silent for so many years, the ship has much to say. But her time is running out. Two and a half miles down in a hostile world as alien as another planet, Titanic's majestic hull is disintegrating. The ocean is claiming her once again. With clues of her demise slowly dissolving, we return to Titanic live. You are watching something that no one has ever seen before. The first live images from the bottom of the ocean, from the final resting place of history's most legendary ship, Titanic. I'm Bob McEwen, and welcome aboard Ocean Voyager, here in the middle of the North Atlantic. In fact, at the very spot where Titanic sank back in 1912. For the next two hours, you and we will be part of an extraordinary expedition that has brought together scientists and historians, some of the most sophisticated undersea technology in the world and the people who operate it, and all to help us better understand what exactly happened to Titanic on that fateful night 86 years ago. But the Ocean Voyager isn't alone out here. It's one ship in a flotilla of four. And somewhere else on the water, in a ship called the Abay Supporter, is my colleague Sarah James. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Bob. The Abay is a research vessel, but its duty on this mission is to provide a temporary home for a treasure which eluded this team back in 1996, a treasure which has co-expedition leaders George Tullock and P.H. Narjale, very happy men. It is called the Big Piece, and it is the largest piece of the Titanic ever to be brought to the surface since the ship sank. As you can see behind me, microbiologists and other experts are already busy studying the Big Piece, and we will bring those stories to you. In addition, there's another vessel that's part of the fleet, this one two and a half miles down. It is the French mini sub Nautile, and the images you are seeing are unprecedented. The first live images from inside their inner space capsule, and we will be speaking to them a little bit later on. But for now, we want to return you to our intrepid robotic explorer Magellan for more of those live pictures. You are looking live at the bow of the Titanic.
Welcome to an unprecedented event in television. I'm John Siegenthaler. For the next two hours, Discovery Channel will bring you the first ever live television broadcast from the most famous place in the ocean, the spot in the North Atlantic where the Titanic sank 86 years ago. You and people watching in more than 100 countries around the world on Discovery Channels and other networks will see history in the making. You'll see pictures from a tiny manned submarine exploring Titanic's wreckage on the ocean floor in one of the most hostile environments on Earth. You will learn about the tiny microbes eating the Titanic's hull, finishing the destruction the iceberg began. And we'll bring you never before seen images from deep inside the heart of Titanic. Let's go live now using state of the art technology, 1,500 miles out into the North Atlantic where a fleet of ships is stationed, then traveled down two and a half miles underwater where Titanic lies. Bob McEwen is aboard the research vessel Ocean Voyager with a team of experts. Thank you, John. These are pictures taken by the ROV Magellan of RMS Titanic, live for the first time, 12,500 feet down on the ocean floor. ROV stands for Remote Operated Vehicle. Basically, Magellan is an unmanned submersible connected to this ship, the Ocean Voyager, by a two and a half mile long cable. There's a control room downstairs from us here where the pilots, they don't like to be called drivers, they're pilots, of Magellan do their work. And basically, they can, as you'll see during the next two hours, fly Magellan up, over, and around Titanic to provide the kind of spectacular pictures that uh, we've already seen and we'll see many, many more of. As those pictures come across our monitors today, I'll be joined by Charles Haas, who's an historian, and a man who knows about as much as Titanic, of Titanic as anyone else. Charlie, you've been down twice. You've dived twice to the wreck. That's right. In either of those trips, have you seen the kind of vivid pictures we're seeing tonight? Well, of course, the human eye adds the dimension of 3D, but when you're looking through Nautil's porthole, which is only perhaps five inches across, uh, you really have a very narrow view. So this is really the, the widescreen epic version of Titanic, and it's very spectacular. Having been there, give us a guided tour of what we're seeing right now. Okay, right now we're actually coming up the, uh, the forward mast of the ship, uh, and this is really where Titanic's drama begins on the night of April 14th and 15th, 1912. The lookouts actually entered the mast down below, and climbed a ladder inside the mast up to the crow's nest itself. And as we can see on the monitor there, uh, that is the hatchway through which they entered the crow's nest. That would be a tight squeeze from what I can see here. It really was. Uh, the mast is only about three feet across, and um, they, they worked a, a long shift in very cold weather that night. Um, and about 11.40 p.m., uh, lookout Frederick Fleet and his uh, mate Reginald Lee were thinking that the uh, the watch was going to end uneventfully when uh, they spotted something in the distance and it turned out to be a, a towering iceberg and uh, Fleet imme immediately sounded the crow's nest bell and telephoned the bridge perhaps using that wire down at the base of the uh, opening there. Uh, that may very well have been the wire into which he plugged his uh, portable telephone. And uh, if we look very closely, I think you can actually see the steps or the handholds inside the, uh, the mast there where the men had climbed up earlier in the evening. So the, the, the warning is telephoned to the bridge, and for the next 37 seconds, uh, Fleet and Lee watch and wait as the iceberg draws closer to Titanic's side. The beginning of the story that brought us here tonight. We'll continue to follow the unmanned exploration of Titanic from Ocean Voyage as we go along. Meanwhile, Sarah James has been covering the manned operations that are crucial to this expedition. She's standing by now on the Abay supporter. Sarah. Hi there, Bob. And I have with me the co-expedition leaders here. To my right, P.H. Narjolet, who's a commander in the French Navy and who has spent more time on the wreck of Titanic than anybody else, and his partner, George Tullock. The two of them are very proud men tonight because we've managed to achieve a live hookup with Nautil for the first time ever. PH, let me ask you first, why is it so difficult to, in essence, go live to something that's only two and a half miles away? Maybe because it needs uh, months and months of preparation, and we have to develop some new technology like the fiber optic, and uh, it takes, of course, a lot of time. And that's why it's very difficult. And it, yes, and plus we are with the weather, with a lot of uh, parameter like that. Speaking of the weather, it was touch and go with the weather today. You weren't even sure that you could send Nautil down. 
Uh, yes, we are very. Sometimes we say yes, no, and uh, we are watching uh, all the forecast, and uh, and now it's okay. George, we can see images of the hookup. Can you describe how that works? Yes, um, basically um, what we're doing is taking a fiber optic link all the way to the seabed. Then we're taking a hard coax cable out of there over to a special garage that has 2,000 kilometers, uh, 2,000 meters of, uh, two kilometers of fiber optic cable that Nautil pulls out like a fishing rod and then can run around on the seabed where it wants to go, giving us a live image. A switcher inside Nautil lets us go live to either Nautil's main camera, Robin's camera when we deploy her, or inside the sphere. Robin is the little mini arm of Nautil. Where do you hope to send her? Well, we're going to take her in between the largest uh, reciprocating, the largest piston engines ever made, the 1,000 ton engines of the Titanic. We hope to get deep into there uh, to the to the um, actual breakup area so that we can learn something there and then into the turbine area on the port side. This is all brand new. What's it like to take a look at that image live from the ocean floor, live from Nautil? Well, those are our teammates down there, and we know when we dive, we're always, you know, one second away from saying goodbye to everything. So it's kind of a strange for us as teammates to watch them knowing that they're that, that close to the edge of trouble. All right, a very proud moment for George Tulloch and P.H. Narjale. We'll be back with them in just a little bit. But we want to return you now to the other explorer, the remote-operated vehicle, Magellan. And you are looking at more of these incredible images from Magellan's seeing-eye camera at the bottom of the ocean, live on Titanic Live. When we come back, the armada of ships, the army of experts, the miles of cable, all the high-tech wizardry aimed at giving us an unprecedented look at the mighty Titanic as it really was. Plus, an operation fraught with danger. A dedicated band of scientists battled the same powerful forces that destroyed the Titanic. Pull them up tight. Man, what a mess. And finally, a voyage into the heart of the ship. Never before seen pictures of Titanic's interior. The ghostly chandeliers still gleaming. The cabin of the doomed ship's captain. Look at that. That's incredible. You are watching a special live Discovery Channel presentation and those incredible pictures of the Titanic. It's a tremendous technological challenge sending cameras thousands of feet under the ocean to see Titanic in new ways and to better understand what happened when she went down and what's happening to her now. Let's go back now to the North Atlantic and Bob McEwen on the Ocean Voyager. Thank you, John. A haunting view here of what remains of Titanic's wheelhouse. That uh, section sitting vertically there in the middle of the picture is the telemotor. That's where the wheel would have sat. Now, of course, the wheel's gone. It was wood. It's long gone after 86 years, as is most of the, of the superstructure of the wheelhouse. But that is the point at which they tried desperately for those 37 seconds to avoid the iceberg on the night of April the 14th, 1912. Tom Detweiler has joined me. He is director of operations for the Titanic exhibition. He's a veteran ocean engineer, once worked for the legendary Jacques Cousteau. Tom, for this expedition, what is the assignment that Magellan, the ROV shooting these pictures, will have? It's primarily to get into some of the areas that are a little bit dangerous or, or that are too tight for the man submersible to get into, take close-up imagery, to carry the Woods Hole cameras down, which are shooting the very high-resolution imagery that we see here, uh, allowing us to do a forensic study to, to try to find out what may have caused the breakup of the ship, those sorts of things. Yeah. You know as well as we do that we were right up to airtime almost afraid we wouldn't be able to get these pictures in because you'd have to bring Magellan out of the water because of the weather, which has been bad for days now. How difficult is it to keep this ship stable in order to drive Magellan precisely two and a half miles below. It's very difficult. Our drivers are doing a great job. On our screen up there, we see that we have a 100-meter circle that we've given them, and they have to keep the ship within that circle. And they're doing that with a manual joystick right now. and requires an intense concentration. Well, we're and grateful. Yeah, absolutely. So far, so good. You know, the Magellan Project is really only one aspect of an exceedingly ambitious expedition out here in the middle of the North Atlantic. But I think if there's one thing that everyone has learned so far, it's that when you're working in the middle of the ocean, there's nothing that is easy. You're in the water. 
It may be the most complex peacetime operation at sea in history. Ten months of planning, a flotilla of ships, almost a hundred experts from a dozen different countries, the most advanced deep sea and communication technologies on the planet, and the video gear to broadcast it all back to the world. All of it in the very middle of the North Atlantic Ocean, hundreds of miles from any kind of dry land. All right, you ready, Titanic 98? So just how tough is this mission? I would say it's Earth's hardest frontier. We climbed Everest and, and went to the moon before we went to the bottom of the ocean because it's a much harder environment, absolutely. The dive plan is daring and dangerous. It comes down to a tale of two ships, Nadir and the Ocean Voyager. They're fixed by sophisticated global positioning systems right over the Titanic's remains. Nadir harbors the manned submersible Nautil, while the Ocean Voyager launches the remote operated vehicle, or ROV, called Magellan. And the key to beaming astounding pictures live to millions worldwide? This five mile cable that carries video through 13,000 feet of water back to the Ocean Voyager. With this setup, the expedition can use multiple vehicles to dive on the Titanic wreck site, a site about the size of more than 15 football fields. It means an astonishing amount of new information and never before seen pictures of the mysterious wreck. But it's also very risky. Tom Detweiler is the operations manager for the Ocean Voyager. Well, it's very difficult because we're pulling together more platforms, more ships than has generally ever been done for an oceanographic expedition. If those miles of cables were to snag on Titanic wreckage, it could mean disaster. Wait. And that's especially so for the manned submersible called Nautil. This yellow submarine, whose name is French for Nautilus, can dive to depths unreachable by almost any other submarine in the world including those of the U.S. Navy. Nautil is launched from Nadir using a crane. As many as three people can squeeze into the cramped seven-foot interior for the two-hour, two-and-a-half-mile drop to the wreck site. Only four inches of titanium protect those inside from the crushing pressure of the sea outside. A tiny crack in this hull, and Nautil would literally implode. If the tether of the ROV broke, it could fall down and fall across the man submersible or go through the, the thrusters and, and disable it, and then they would be stuck on the bottom. For these crews, those kinds of risks can make a dangerous trip on the North Atlantic in a 15-foot motorized raft called a Zodiac seem like an everyday commute. Half a mile away from the deer, the Ocean Voyager operates as a command center for the ROV Magellan. TNT light. Check. One of only a very few remote operated yeah, yeah. vehicles of its Check. kind in the world, Magellan yeah. is the workhorse of this trip. Built in 1991, she weighs about three tons, as much as a baby elephant. It takes four people to steer her, manipulate her arms, and operate her sophisticated cameras. What are we looking at there, Bruce? It's a pump. The first images Magellan captures from the wreck's debris field are haunting. Reminders of the everyday life Titanic once knew. Ron Schmidt is the senior ROV pilot. It just produces a, a thrill that, um, similar, I would guess, would be walking on the moon. It may be thrilling. It is not easy. You're tethered to the mothership. If you sever the umbilical cord, you're in trouble. Can you come in some step, please? Uh, 2,300 meters. With so many links in this intricate chain, almost anything could happen. But Tom Detweiler says his team is ready for anything. We're taking a big risk, but we've tried to put together a crack team, and everybody's an expert in their own systems, and we'll hopefully keep everything running. And happily right now, ROV Magellan is up and running, or more precisely, two and a half miles down and running, sending back these marvelous shots of Titanic. This, the promenade deck below and the boat deck above. The boat deck, of course, where the lifeboats proved to be dramatically too few for everyone on board. There's much more to come from the Ocean Voyager as we continue with Titanic Live.
coming up, the clues to a tragedy, unlocking the mystery of why the ship sank. How could the world's greatest vessel break apart and crash to the ocean floor? And travel back down the hatches and see Titanic as it hasn't been seen in 86 years from the radio room where the last distress calls were sent down the grand staircase and into the grandest room on board God is that Welcome back to Titanic Live where we've been bringing you remarkable images from the Titanic wreck site Scientists are also pushing the limits of deep sea technology using both manned submersibles and remote operated vehicles or ROVs to investigate the ship in more detail than ever before. We now take you back live to the North Atlantic and Sarah James aboard the research vessel Abay. Thanks, John. Well, where I am standing is two and a half miles above a remarkable site which you are able to see right now. Images from the French mini-sub Nautil. These are the first images from a manned sub, and Nautil is gracefully flying over the stern of the Titanic. And what we're about to do now has never been done. I'm going to talk, I hope, to Paul Mathias, who is down in Nautil and who is exploring the wreck site. Paul Mathias, can you hear me? Yes, Sarah, can you hear me? Do you feel a bit like an astronaut, Paul? It is a lot like an astronaut, Sarah. We've uh, managed to come down here uh, two and a half miles beneath the sea surface, and uh, we're uh, very, very remote from all the things that are going on up there right now. Uh, it's uh, very otherworldly. It's a really different, uh, different planet, different environment. Right now, Paul, by speaking to us, you're making broadcast history. Do you feel the pressure? I feel the pressure in more ways than one. I, I get the pun, and uh, of course we are constantly concerned about the outside pressure, meaning the uh, thousands of pounds of, of water pressure on the outside of the submarine. And of course there's also the pressure of talking to us live. I see Max Dubois, the pilot, who's sitting just to your left. Can you show us, Paul, the various cameras that you have aboard Nautil? Maybe you could just whip us through the images that you're seeing there. Yeah, sure, uh, Sarah. The first one that you're looking at is uh, our camera uh, that's controlled, uh, uh, it's fixed on the outside of the front of Nautil. Uh, the second camera is uh, our pan and tilt. The third is the view of the ROV, um, and the fourth, of course, is the uh, inside camera. So we have a uh, total of... Go ahead. There's a bit of a delay here, so if one of us speaks, the other one can't overlap. What I was going to ask you, Paul, is you're having an opportunity to see the Titanic wreck firsthand. You were one of the key people who exploded a myth about the Titanic, the myth that it was a gash of an iceberg that broke it down. Can you tell us quickly about what you determined happened to Titanic? Well, the popular myth has been that uh, the iceberg cut a 300-foot-long gash in the side of uh, Titanic. And uh, in 96, we had a chance to come out with uh, some imaging equipment and detect the openings uh, that were caused by the iceberg in the bow. Uh, in actuality, what we found were uh, six separate slits and uh, uh, the total area of those slits was something less than uh, 15 square feet. And I guess what's so amazing, Paul, is to think that something that's less than 15 square feet could have doomed a liner that was four city blocks long. We're going to be talking to you more in just a moment, but while we look at Nautil's fantastic images, we want to talk about what you'll be doing this particular time. You're going to be doing some mosaicing. Is that right, Paul? Yeah, the, the plan, Sarah, is to... The plan is to collect uh, high-resolution images over the entire site and create a kind of virtual reality uh, that would be of uh, incredibly high resolution so that we can uh, interact and determine where all the various pieces of Titanic uh, have fallen onto the seabed. 
heard that described as trying to siphon off the Atlantic, snap a picture, and put the Atlantic back on. That sounds kind of easy, but it can't be. No, it, uh, it really will be a massive quantity of data that we'll be dealing with, uh, very, very high-resolution data that uh, would allow us to see an object the size of a pencil on the bottom. And our job will be to try to merge all that together and create this ultra-high-resolution uh, virtual reality. So it, uh, it will take uh, a lot of horsepower, but uh, uh, the kinds of computers and graphics that we have today will make it uh, a possibility. Paul, can you do me a favor? I can see Max right to the left of you, the pilot. He's yep. looking out of his porthole. Can you tell me yep. what you're seeing? Because we're looking at some stunning images of the stern. Where are you? Well, we uh, just so happen to be at the, uh, the two uh, engines at the stern. Um, I'm going to switch over uh, here to the ROV camera where you can see some really stunning footage. This is coming from a remote vehicle called Robin, uh, which comes out of the front of Nautil and uh, it flies around uh, on its own on a tether uh, controlled by us here in the uh, in the submarine. Paul, oh, we're also uh, seeing Yeah, at we're the also moment, seeing we're stuff that looks like snow. What is the stuff that looks like snow, Paul? Well, we have uh, a lot of sources of the, the snow down here. It's, uh, uh, of course, it's biological. Originally, there are uh, many, many uh, small creatures down here, uh, many, many bacteria, specifically bacteria or microorganisms that are producing rust as a byproduct, like you see right here. Uh, this is up on top of one of the massive 1,000-ton uh, images is where we're looking right now. And uh, this is uh, uh, one of the intermediate pressure uh, uh, cylinders. You can see all the rust that's uh, draping down all over that. So a lot of the snow that you're seeing, Sarah, is uh, uh, some of these small uh, bacteria, small microorganisms. Paul, one of the things that's important for people to realize is that the stern is in very different shape from the bow. The bow looks like it's almost docked, but the stern is all twisted asunder. Can you explain why that happened? Well, that's uh, one of our objectives out, out here uh, uh, on this expedition, Sarah, is to try to determine exactly what happened to the stern. Um, as you say, the, the bow looks like it, it's still sailing. It's upright, and uh, in 96, uh, I, I uh, did all my imaging around the bow, and uh, I must say, uh, this year seeing the stern for the first time, um, it's, uh, it's really quite, uh, quite different, really uh, quite dramatic in that it uh, appears to have really crashed down hard into the bottom. So um, one of the things we'll be trying to determine is uh, uh, just what did happen uh, clearly to the stern section. On a more personal note, I understand that one of the goals is to try to discover if the gates in third class were locked, prohibiting people from coming up to the boat decks and escaping. Will you be able to penetrate with those little cameras like Robin to discover if indeed those gates were closed? Well, we are going to uh, uh, try to uh, try to reach that objective as well, and uh, our expectation is that, yes, we will be able to penetrate that deeply with Robin. Let me ask you another question on a personal note. You must be thinking about your family down there. Have they given you anything as kind of a little good luck charm? Well, uh, yeah, now that you mention it, uh, they have, uh, my daughter did send me uh, uh, Tweety Bird along, both uh, my daughter and uh, son uh, wanted, uh, wanted to come along with us, uh, uh, but uh, the best we could do was uh, to bring along uh, my daughter's uh, Tweety Bird. Do you want to say hi to them really quickly? Yes, I do. I'd like to say hello and to my family uh, and all my friends. Uh, hello from the bottom of the ocean, 13,000 feet uh, in the North Atlantic at, at Titanic. Uh, I'd like to switch Hello for... To uh, Paul, Paul, we're going to have to leave uh, you for just a moment. We can't stand to do it, but we're going to leave you looking at these extraordinary images from Nautil. And indeed, it looks like you're seeing just a glimpse. Yes, there it is. What you're looking at 
is the outside of that yellow submarine carefully making its way around the stern of Titanic. Yet another live image from the bottom of the sea. come back. Danger at sea. The perils that threaten to sink the mission. Brave explorers risk everything to bring the Titanic back to life. Plus, the tiny enemy that is destroying the great ship. Why time is running out for what remains of the wreck. You are watching a special Discovery Channel presentation bringing you pictures live from the North Atlantic and the wreckage of the Titanic. The debris is a brutal reminder of the vulnerability of technology when pitted against the power of nature. And that has been one of the enduring lessons of the Titanic. The expedition is proof of how fragile our technical skills still are. From bad weather to equipment breakdowns to power outages, the international team of explorers has had to overcome some of the most difficult conditions on Earth, or underwater. Back now live to the North Atlantic and Bob McEwen on the Ocean Voyager. Thanks John. This is more of course from the ROV Magellan moving aft of the wheelhouse now along the promenade deck. And thanks also to the pilots of the ROV Magellan who are flying her for us tonight uh, from the Ocean Voyager. Troy Linnae and Ron Schmidt. And I'm here now with George Brochi, who's the project manager for Magellan on this expedition. George, how is it that two guys who look like they're playing a multi-million dollar video game can, with such precision, maneuver a three-ton submersible two and a half miles away? Well, actually, the vehicle in, on dry land weighs almost three tons. In the water, we use syntactic foam. This is a piece of it. Yeah. The syntactic foam makes the vehicle buoyant and we have approximately 70 pounds of buoyancy on the vehicle when it's on the bottom. 12, so if it, were, if it were constructed of something else, for example, it might sink like a stone. Oh, absolutely. But with syntactic foam? Syntactic it, foam is basically millions of small microspheres, little balls of glass in a cubic inch. Now, if, Titanic, if Titanic had known about syntactic foam on that night back in 1912, none of us would have to be here tonight. Is that uh, this will show would yeah. probably not be on, yes. Yeah. I think the Magellan Project, as, as part of the Titanic expedition, is a good example of how terrific technology in the right hands can make almost anything look easy. But as the Magellan crew has found out firsthand this week, the ocean is one of the most unpredictable places on the face of the Earth. When it comes to deep sea exploration, they say the one thing that's sure to surface is Murphy's Law. If it can go wrong, it will, no matter how much planning and effort goes into an expedition of this magnitude. Everyone knows you can't fool Mother Nature. High winds and up to 15-foot swells have continuously pummeled the ocean voyager. Despite valiant efforts to protect the gear, damage is inevitable. There have even been power outages, and the ship's pilots had to steer the ocean voyager without its precision navigation system, a tough task with the currents tossing the ship about. But on day five, all systems are go for Magellan's first voyage. The unmanned ROV's mission to send back video of Titanic using high-resolution cameras for the first time. My cameras are working, and I hope, them, I hope that they stay working through the entire series of dives. Magellan captures these incredible images of Titanic's debris field, giving us new and dramatic pictures of that most famous wreck site. After a successful day on the ocean's floor, they bring her back up to adjust the equipment. Bad luck strikes again. We got such a ball out here, we can't do anything with it. Magellan's tether, its lifeline, gets tangled into a giant yellow knot, turning the million dollar vessel upside down. Need to get that float flipped over. I know. Pull him up tight. It's turned on its side. Turn in the right direction. I think it's going the right way. Yeah, right's different than left. It's turned every way but up. Man, what a mess. You need to just plaque this and pull it up over the top. 
communicating through headphones. The team works tirelessly to untangle the knots. It takes hours, but finally Magellan is out of the water. Up and in. Not bad. Get it, get it. Yeah, baby. Out of water, 1246. The next day begins with a successful launch, until suddenly Magellan's lights go out and she's left dangling in darkness. When the high-powered lights finally kick back on, Murphy's Law returns too, knocking out the two high-resolution, high-definition TV cameras. The disappointment is palpable. It sucks! Hey! They bring her up empty-handed. A long day's work yields no new pictures. Bad news piles up like the ocean's waves. Stormy weather has prevented crucial testing of the smallest ROV called T-Rex, intended to explore deep inside the Titanic. It's delayed the dreams of its inventor, Bill Willard, a high school physics teacher from North Carolina. It's not gonna drop! But this team of determined engineers works around the clock to get Magellan back in shape for its next dive. Their luck seems to rise and fall like the North Atlantic. So the team's anxiety is understandably high as Magellan begins another voyage to the bottom of the sea. And then, the mesmerizing image of Titanic's rustical covered bow emerges, melting away all the pain and frustration this crew has endured to bring home these magnificent pictures. This is why they've worked so hard. By the way, Bill Willard, the creator of T-Rex, as everyone in Seneca, South Carolina will know, is a South Carolinian. And one of the questions being looked at during this expedition by scientists is exactly how long Titanic will survive in the form we're seeing tonight for future images to be sent back to us of this sort. That's a question that Sarah James has been examining. She's here now. Thanks, Bob. Yes, as a matter of fact, it's something scientists will be able to learn more about from studying the big piece, this largest section of Titanic that's been brought to the surface. With me now is Dr. Roy Cullimore, a microbiologist. And Dr. Cullimore, if you could tell me first, what are rusticles? Rusticles are like rusty concrete, but they're very, very porous and they are alive. And they're growing because there are whole bunch of different types of bacteria and molds all growing together to make a very elegant and complicated home. When we look at the rusticles here, we see that they are all heading in one direction. Why is that? That's because they're trying to get to the food first. The food is in the water flowing towards them. And so the rusticle that wins is the one who gets to the water first. The same thing happens in a water well when there are rusticles growing down there. And it's going to be through studying those rusticles that Dr. Cullimore will be able to tell us many more details about the fate of the wreck. Ratfish, get out of my way. On the ocean floor where Titanic rests, two and a half miles beneath the North Atlantic, there's a city of life. It takes four inches of titanium to protect Nautil and her valuable cargo of humanity. Yet only a thin shell protects this crab, adapted to its own environment. The Titanic is a particular environment, and that particular environment is selected which organisms will grow there, whereas the environment up here is obviously selected that we are a species that can grow up here. Titanic's rich ecosystem holds a deep fascination for marine biologist Roy Cullimore. But it's these eerie stalagmite-like structures, called rusticles, that he finds most compelling. The rusticles are the dominant uh, organisms on the Titanic. And it happens that that extreme environment is a suitable one for these microorganisms, and they are able to extract the iron out of the Titanic. Rusticles grow as bacteria devour the iron from Titanic's hull. Despite their beauty, they pose the biggest threat to the remains of the wreck. When you look at the Titanic today from the 1996 expedition, I would say that the rusticles are removing 0.1 of a ton of iron from the steel every day. 
And so it's only going to be the matter of possibly 90 years before the Titanic biologically implodes, collapses into itself, and eventually simply becomes an iron ore deposit on the floor of the ocean. The great ship, once considered a symbol of technology's triumph, will ultimately be destroyed by some of Earth's tiniest creatures. That lends a note of urgency as well. Time is running out for those searching for answers from Titanic. What is this? For this expedition, Dr. Cullermore will test several types of metals to see which the rusticals prefer. He's built a platform with a smorgasbord of steel for the rusticals to dine on. We've got a really tough steel. We've got a very strong steel. We have a mild steel. We have steels that have been twisted and bent and tempered and burnt and hammered. And what we want to do is see whether the way that we've treated the steel affects the way the rusticals first grab onto the steel. After months of preparation and hard work, Dr. Cullimore is ready. Back to Nautil for the two-hour free fall to the ocean floor. After several unsuccessful attempts, Dr. Cullimore's platform of steel now sits in the engine room of the Titanic. It will stay here for at least a year until he returns to check on the rusticals' feast. Hectic, tiring. Stern section is uh, is a powerful mess, and uh, never realised just how bad and how destructive the forces of nature had been. Good if there's a little bit of color. During his dive, Dr. Cullimore found the rusticals' appetite to be even more voracious now than in 1996. He expects the demise of what's left of the Titanic to hasten over time. But Dr. Cullimore has hope as well that his rustical traps may benefit those of us on the surface. What I hope we can learn is, number one, is there a way to produce even better steels that are less likely to biologically deteriorate? So the tragedy of the Titanic can be turned into a modern day treasure of knowledge. And I'd like to be a part of that treasure. For an example of exactly what those rusticles are doing, we take you live back down two and a half miles where Magellan's cameras are showing you the rusticles growing on the expansion joints. This is the deck below the promenade deck and you can get an idea of just how much damage they are doing to Titanic. Indeed, everyone here tells us that the damage just in the last two years is incredible. Again, more live images from Magellan as we continue Titanic Live. Coming up, we know what happened to the Titanic. It hit an iceberg. But why did the unsinkable ship break apart and go down? Solving the mystery. And the mission to recover a piece of the Titanic. What do scientists hope to learn now that part of the ship's hull has seen the surface for the first time since 1912? They had two hours to live. Freezing winds, water, and pitch black night were closing in fast. This unsinkable ship was breaking up beneath their feet. It was the maiden voyage of the Titanic. And now Discovery Channel reveals what really happened that horrific night. In this historic video set, Titanic The Complete Story, you'll see three hours of dramatic eyewitness accounts and computer animation that recreate the nightmarish events of this epic disaster. See astounding footage of the ship's hull that proves it wasn't a 300-foot gash, but just 12 square feet that sank this massive vessel. How could such minimal damage break up and bury the Titanic and 1,500 people? High-tech equipment and submersibles take you to the ocean floor for a crystal clear look at the evidence. Call now to order your copy of this three-hour video set for just $29.95. Time is running out. Call 1-800-332-8877. That's 1-800-332-8877. Call now. We are back with our special Discovery Channel presentation being broadcast live to more than 100 countries around the world. 
Our image of the great Titanic disaster and the one we've seen in the movies is a picture of the giant ship breaking up into two pieces and then sinking beneath the waves. But did it really happen that way? The explorers at the Titanic site are finding new evidence to solve the mystery of how the ship sank and what happened to it during its last two and a half mile voyage down to the bottom of the sea. We go back now live to the expedition in the North Atlantic and Bob McEwen aboard the Ocean Voyager. Thank you, John. The ROV Magellan continuing now its tour, its historic trip around Titanic's bow section. Down here near the mud line, Charlie Haas, tell me what we're seeing here. This is the actual uh, level, if you will, where the iceberg uh, really did its damage. Uh, we found in 1996 that it, rather than a, a huge gaping 300-foot hole, as had been pictured in many 1912 publications, it was actually a, a very small series of stabs, uh, just six in number, uh, totaling about 12 square feet and what we're seeing here is the the actual uh, level of where some of those stabs took place down at the uh, the sand line as it's called about uh, 14 feet above the keel yeah. you have been down twice now to Titanic you're looking at these images along with us now what change have you seen in that time the the, the the overwhelming change that I am reacting to is the amount of, of corrosion and, and disintegration. Uh, where once I saw yes. walls, now there are spaces. Uh, where once it was a, a, a fairly uh, straightforward thing to identify, now it's a, a tumult of destruction. So the, uh, the degradation in just the last two years is astounding. One of the truly remarkable things I think about Titanic is that after 86 years with all the analysis and the books and the movies about this most famous of ships, there are still mysteries, still unanswered questions. And it is looking for the resolutions to those questions that I think brings members of the expedition like Charlie Haas back to the North Atlantic again this year. During the 1998 expedition, the team of experts exploring Titanic is tackling an array of puzzling mysteries. According to recent evidence, it's now believed that when Titanic struck the iceberg, the wounds to the ship were very small, a series of separations, often as thin as a human finger. At the bottom, is to build evidence for this new theory, the, the team plots a route along Titanic's exterior to look for signs of iceberg damage. You have to see that far. Basically what you're looking for is, even though the decks have been compressed... The investigators will deploy the ROV Magellan along the starboard side, near a massive hole in Titanic's hull. At the wreck site, Magellan works its way along the mud line, which is concealing most of the wound in Titanic's side. As it maneuvers, Magellan's cameras capture a startling image. They're showing a great interest in this hole here. This small separation of hull plate may be the first photograph of the fatal iceberg damage. The 1998 investigators are also focusing on Titanic's rivets, which may have failed, contributing to the disaster. Get a burn here, we can do some measurements. The massive piece of the ship's hull, retrieved just days ago, could help us to better understand the role yeah, of those rivets. Right here. Uh, right, right, right. We hope uh, to learn from the rivet story that uh, maybe how the sinking sequence I, actually started. A lot of, I don't know whether it's corrosion or working or... Notice the trend in those that we have analyzed. And they seem to tell us a story that these rivets may have actually failed. Yes, yeah, with, uh, the 1998 investigators also want to know more about how and why Titanic's massive hull shattered on calm seas. Okay, bring up hydraulics and lights. Using Magellan, they explore a large area littered with pieces of Titanic, known as the debris field. Hidden somewhere in this rubble are clues to the ship's destruction. The debris field is spread out across the ocean floor between the bow and the stern. Light objects, such as pipes and plates, are found farther from the wreck. Heavy objects, on the other hand, like boilers, are found clustered close to the stern. 
just to right this pattern Thank suggests you. that titanic may have broken so apart here, close to the ocean here. bottom yes if, if the sh ship had broken at the surface you would expect the borders and if the borders fell out you'd expect them to be fairly widely separated at the aft end of the bow the rov drivers guide magellan on a dangerous search for boilers inside titanic peering through the wreckage the team identifies five intact boilers five for five. this contradicts survivors who testified to hearing the boilers explode and crash through the ship it gives us an indication that probably all 24 boilers that were in operation didn't explode and didn't leave their foundations and after the, the investigators the also want to know if Titanic's watertight holds exploded inwards, causing enormous destruction. The main question was what happened to the vessel once she went below the waves? How did she become in the condition that she's now in? And especially in the after end, why is the after end so badly broken up? The images Magellan sends to the surface are astounding. Titanic steel plates, one inch thick, have been crumpled like paper. Yeah, it is. It's incredible. The forces are involved here. I think you can see the torture this ship went through when it sank. It's uh, the steel plate is just twisted in all different shapes and forms. Incredulous, incredulous forces involved in this sinking process. Much of which we don't understand yet. And two of the people you've just met, naval architects David Livingstone and Bill Garski, are with us again on the 1998 Titanic expedition. Gentlemen, have you seen anything so far out here in the North Atlantic this time that would explain those tremendous forces that created such damage on the stern and at the separation between the bow and stern? Uh, I think we've seen uh, a tearing apart of plates. The big piece is a, a good example of what we have seen the forces that are involved here that rip the plates apart, pull rivets out of the plate, bearing failures, almost anything you can think of in terms of failure or in the big piece. Would you agree, David? That's quite right. Uh, and uh, it's extremely interesting that there's practically every mode of failure that, 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 that you could imagine. It's, uh, it's not a single failure, it's not a single type of failure. Uh, it, I think it illustrates that the, the, the system was very well balanced, uh, that lots of things failed, not just one or two things. Well, what would explain rivets failing and steel failing? Again, huge forces on the surface. Uh, the vessel probably started to crack uh, because of the, the bending moment when the stern rose out of the water. The bending moment was a magnitude uh, greater than uh, what the ship was ever designed to take. And then, and then, of course, the extreme pressures uh, on a hull that uh, was, was filled with air. And it would simply implode with very violently, uh, probably at uh, something more than 100 meters. More damage from the bow section of Titanic as seen by the ROV Magellan as Titanic Live continues. Thanks, guys. amazing journey into the dark depths of the wreck, the incredible, never-before-seen images of what life was like for the people on that fateful voyage. Welcome back to Titanic Live, where Discovery Channel is bringing you an historic expedition in the North Atlantic, including the first-ever pictures from the Titanic wreck site. Let's check in again on the status of Nautil's journey with Sarah James, who's on board the ship Abay. Thanks very much, John. And what I'd like to do first is to dial back into our long distance connection to the bottom of the ocean to Paul Mathias, who's two and a half miles below. Paul, you still there? Paul, can you hear us? Yeah, hi, Sarah. How's it going? It's going very well, we were looking at some fantastic pictures just outside your porthole. Where are you on the stern right now, Paul? Well, we're right near one of the uh, uh, thousand-ton engines down here, and uh, 
We're work, working our way through the uh, uh, the stern. We're getting inside the stern, uh, underneath uh, some big overhangs, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, really quite a complex, really quite a uh, destroyed uh, part of the ship that uh, that we're looking at. But the the majest uh, majesty is still here. You can still see in these giant image uh, engines uh, like this one here. That's uh, just coming by, really, the, the, the massive size, you get the feel for the, uh, uh, you get the feel for uh, this being the largest vehicle, the largest moving uh, item that uh, man had ever made at the time. Uh, it's just, it's very, very incredible. Paul, at this point, I'm going to bring in two other voices that will be very familiar to you. P.H. Narjale, who spent more time on the wreck than anybody else, including Captain Smith and George Tullock, who has also made several trips down to the wreck site. George, let me start with you, if I can. Those engines that he's talking about, how big are they? Well, they're four and a half stories, 45 feet high. They're the largest piston engines ever made by man before or since, and they weigh a 1,000 tons each. Uh, they're just the biggest piston engines with an eight-foot piston. It's incredible. PH, what we are also looking at is that Nautil, and maybe, Paul, you can show us this. I don't know if you can. Nautil is on a tether. That makes this a lot more dangerous. Can you tell me why? Yeah, because if this rope is going in the propeller, one of the uh, propeller of the thruster or the main propeller of the of the Nautil, the Nautil will be attached on the bottom, and, and if you cannot cut it, it will be a nightmare for the, the Nautil. And in fact, that's what we can see right there, that white light. What is that white light? The white light is the light of the nautil. Right. And now we, we can see the first cylinder. The, no, the cylinder number two is a high pressure cylinder of the port side reciprocative engine. George, you've been down to this site many times. Yes. People don't know very much about the stern. What's your theory about what happened to cause that extraordinary damage? Well, I think that that the stern did not want to follow the bow down because it had water and buoyancy in it. And by being forced down, it took tremendous implosion. And on the way down, this tremendous force of the ocean capturing that air pocket just did a tremendously uh, implosive force on all this steel. Paul, if we can return to you for a moment, can you describe for us where you are right now? It looks like a kind of a tangle of pipes. Where are you? Yeah, we're uh, sorry, we're right next to the uh, the starboard engine right now. This is one of the pumps, and uh, uh, we're looking at uh, something that doesn't really look uh, like it's been down here for over 85 years. It's got just a thin film of dust on it. Uh, we're going to uh, try to uh, move closer to it and have a, a, a closer look, but uh, in the background you can see uh, a lot of the rust and uh, a lot of rust gro overgrowing the... Uh, uh, the rest of these giant engines. We should also point out, Paul, it's not exactly uh, warm and cozy down there, is it? Well, it's not, Sarah, and it's getting uh, getting colder by the minute. We're inside of a seven-foot sphere, and uh, you can see, uh, I think back here, the uh, condensation is starting to build up. Uh, that's because it's, uh, it's about uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit on the outside. In here right now, it's about uh, 45 or 50 degrees, uh, getting colder all the time. Paul, you know, something else that's fascinating about this is that we have you deployed on the stern, and we have Magellan on the bow. Can you describe where they are in proximity to one another and the distance you have to keep from that ROV? Yeah, the, uh, the Magellan is on the bow. Uh, we decided that uh, uh, keeping her at a distance of uh, over a thousand feet away would be uh, safe enough for us to, uh, to operate and move about here on the stern. Uh, this is really uh, a first. Uh, this this, this uh, transmission is a first. And also having uh, both these vehicles, uh, all these people involved, all these ships involved at this great depth is also uh, quite a remarkable first as well. Uh, I can't tell you how strange it is to uh, be down here in this very small submarine uh, two and a half miles down and yet uh, uh, be talking to you on the surface uh, and uh, sending you these live images as well. It's very strange.
Arkansas. I got to tell you, it feels pretty strange up here too, Paul. It feels sort <laughs> of like one small step for man, one big dive for mankind. Are you thrilled to have made it? Oh, I am thrilled, Sarah, for sure. It's uh, it's uh, uh, really better than anything I could have dreamed for to be uh, part of an expedition like this. Uh, the uh, the uh, interesting discoveries we're making every day here are really make it worthwhile. Any one day on this expedition has has made it all worthwhile. Uh, working with the French uh, closely has been just fantastic. Uh, they've helped us. Uh, we've we've helped them every step of the way. So it's. Uh, it's really uh, uh, quite a privilege, quite an honor to be part of all this. Paul, what I'd like to do as we say goodbye to you for just a moment here is let George and PH say something quickly. What would you like to say to Paul? Hey, uh, Paul, I, I hope I don't have to tell Gail that you're sleeping on the bottom of the ocean tonight. I hope the weather's going to be good enough we can get you home. And uh, nice job. Yes, and I Thanks, hope, Paul, that you can go in the, in the seal, uh, circulating pump as soon as possible okay as soon as okay. possible okay and also we'll tell you a little bit later about recovering nautile at this kind of time it's extraordinarily difficult when it's dark to recover nautile but of course that has been factored in for this mission and we will leave you for just a moment with more live pictures from nautile come back, travel down the decks inside the Titanic. What the wreckage reveals about the people who lived and died aboard that mighty ship. And welcome back everyone to a unique Discovery Channel presentation, bringing you stunning pictures from deeper inside Titanic than anyone has seen before. Despite the amazing technological scope of this mission, we can't forget the tragedy that happened there, the 1,500 individual stories lost with Titanic. The images from inside the wreck help bring those stories dramatically to life. Back now live to our team in the North Atlantic and Bob McEwen on the Ocean Voyager. John, unlike the scenes of mangled destruction that Nautil has been showing us on Titanic's stern tonight, as you tour around the bow section with Magellan, every now and then there's a glimpse of the mundane realities of life as they must have exi existed on Titanic until 11.40 p.m. on the, the night of April the 14th. Charlie Haas is with me. Charlie, describe what that is. Where uh, Magellan is actually hovering over the starboard side of the boat deck, and we are looking down into the bathroom of Captain Edward J. Smith. And as we go in closer, we can actually see the, the plumbing fixtures, the shower head there, and uh, a tub that's very badly in need of a cleaning, I think. Uh, Captain Smith was the senior commander of the White Star Line. Uh, he had more than 30 years of service with the company. Uh, he was 62 years old, and there was some indication that he was planning to retire after this voyage. Now, a lot of the responsibility for what happened that night has been placed by some on the shoulders of Captain Smith. Do you think that is fair? I think he was basically the one that was caught with his hand in the cookie jar. He was following the, the procedures that every commander of the North Atlantic followed. Go at full speed until such time as your lookout told you there was a problem, and then take evasive action. And in his case, that wasn't enough to save his ship. And it was supposed to be his final crossing. Very his retirement that's, voyage. That's what we believe, yes. Yeah. These shots from Magellan of Captain Smith's room and his, his bathtub show why if getting down to Titanic is dangerous, getting inside Titanic is even more dangerous than that. And for all the wonderful things we've seen them do tonight, Nautil at 18 tons and Magellan at almost three tons are simply too big and too valuable to risk on the narrow hallways and mangled inner spaces of Titanic. And that is where Nautil's sidekick, a submersible called Robin, comes in. Beautiful, just spectacular imagery. When Nautil turns on her lights, that's when the show begins. Gliding over the bow anchor, she makes her way down the starboard bow. Then maneuvers over to the side of the ship. That looks like, even looks like a piece of equipment in there. 
Nautil dispatches Little Robin, and the ROV drops down the opening to a place few have seen. This is where Captain Smith went just after midnight to tell wireless operators Jack Phillips and Harold Bride to call for help, where Phillips tapped out in Morse code more than two dozen distress calls. Both men manning their posts until they heard the water gushing in. We've got you good photography of the Marconi transmitter. A tuning apparatus once embedded in the side of a wall. It's just a small part of the state-of-the-art Marconi system, which could reach other ships and land stations more than 500 miles away. Just behind the wireless room, the grand staircase. Robin will use the stairs to visit cabin B-54, the best room on board. She enters through the destroyed glass dome that capped the staircase. A gold-plated and crystal chandelier dangles from a cord, still trying to uphold the glamour of the once grand staircase. Or one could make an entrance, like Colonel Astor or Molly Brown. Robin's topside camera observes the raised wood paneling of a B-deck reception room. It included the most elaborate accommodations, like Suite B-51, booked by the wife and Bruce Ismay in cabin 54. His wash basin in the corner is slowly collapsing. Nearby, one of Ismay's high back chairs tipped over on its side. Penetrating the cabin further, Robin discovers what's left of a door, its knob still in place. Robin's mothership, Nautil, then heads for the bunker hatch, where she'll send her ROV down several decks to explore the mail room. In the hatch, Robin passes these safety bars. On the other side, a third-class rec room. Robin makes her way down to G deck, where the mail sits, off another section. Next, a truly odd sight. Piles of canvas mail bags, covered by what looks like pink shag carpeting. A life form yet to be identified. For her part, Nautil has been busy too, traversing the enclosed promenade deck, her lights bouncing off first-class cabin windows still intact. Charlie Haas, you've been cheating. You've been you've been watching the feed direct from the ROV Magellan, and you're ahead of us. That's where our next sight is. I what sure is am. Uh, what we're doing now, Magellan is hovering over the skylight of the Marconi room, which, as you can see, was located just behind the uh, first funnel. And it it is interesting because this room, in a way, is both the cause and also the salvation of the disaster. What do you mean? The cause, from the standpoint that uh, two very important ice warnings that came into this room were never taken to the bridge because the two radio operators were so busy with backed up traffic that they didn't have the time to take it up to the captain. Up the and the salvation, from the standpoint that these men stayed at their post until almost the very last minute, sending out the distress messages that finally did bring aid. Now, was one of those distress messages, in fact, the first SOS, as has been said? It's actually one of the first. There was actually a, a coastal ship off the uh, American coast that, that sent the first SOS, I believe, in 1908 or 1909. But uh, Titanic is among the first. And luckily, she had a very powerful radio apparatus, uh, one of the most powerful on the North Atlantic. So that certainly made a difference in terms of reception of those distress messages. Charlie, take us into the pictures you've been watching before us. 
This is a, an actual part of that Marconi apparatus. Uh, we're still trying to determine exactly what part it is, but it apparently is a, a bunch of wires coming together in some sort of a, a junction box, uh, possibly a, a means of varying the resistance of the, uh, the uh, cables up to the antenna. And uh, I think this, this shot really demonstrates very nicely that with Magellan you can get up really very, very close and, and almost with a magnifying glass it's, inspect it. It's magical, isn't it? You know, Sarah James, I've got a bunch of grizzled Titanic veterans here who are just enraptured with uh, images coming back from Magellan. I would imagine it's something the same over on a bay with what you're getting back from Nautil. That's exactly right. Everyone here is looking at the monitors, trying to get a glimpse of just what's happening with Nautil. And in fact, we're going to try to go back down to Paul Mathias if we can. Paul, can you hear me? There he is. Paul, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, Sarah. How are you? We're just fine. You know, actually, it's pouring up here. And I'm imagining that down there, you have no idea that's going on. No, we don't. Uh, it's very calm down here, although it's a lot wetter down here than it is up there. Uh, it's very, very still and very, very quiet down here. Uh, uh, it's also very treacherous, and uh, uh, we're trying to uh, very carefully maneuver our way uh, uh, out of the, uh, the engine room area here. We're going to be going around to the side uh, uh, of the stern section here shortly. Uh, as soon as Paul, Robin can I returns. interrupt you for just a second? I'm sure, interrupting you ahead. because I want to ask if you can show us your outside cameras. Can you switch over to to uh, Nautil's camera or Robin's camera so we see what you see? Okay, there's uh, Robin's camera uh, at the moment, uh, backing away from uh, one of the pumps near the engine, uh, and. This is our outside camera. You can see right now it's just looking at uh, the cable going out to, uh, to Robin. Uh, Robin uh, has come out from, uh, uh, is now moving over towards uh, another part of the engine here. Uh, we're looking at, uh, looks like some original paint as well. That is an amazing thought. Well, Paul Mathias, we're going to allow you to continue your underwater odyssey with Nautil. And we're going to talk to you now about something else that's been a huge part of this expedition. This has been the dream of P.H. Nargelet and George Tullock. It is finding and recovering just a piece of Titanic and bringing it to the surface. And now, on this mission, they have finally been able to reclaim this piece from the deep. A section of Titanic's hull sitting on the ocean floor, much as it did for 86 years. It's called the big piece, and reclaiming it was, for years, the stuff that dreams are made of. Ever since the Titanic sank, inventors have been devising schemes to recover it, from suggesting giant magnets to filling the hull with ping pong balls and floating the ship to the surface. Ideas so far-fetched, one person scoffed, raised the Titanic? Why not just lower the Atlantic? Naval architect David Livingstone is not usually given to such flights of fancy, but his company, Harlan and Wolf of Belfast, built the Titanic. And he's long wanted a piece of her back. This is a structure that uh, will probably never be built again. It was built uh, almost plate by plate, uh, using a lot of manual labor. George Tullock's Titanic 98 expedition would see both of their dreams come true. Two years ago, when they first tried to raise the 20-ton hull section, it was Livingstone who figured out where the piece belonged on the great ship. Using original architectural drawings, he discovered that the piece came from a first-class cabin on Titanic's sea deck, starboard side. It was unoccupied. And for George Tullock, Titanic 98 is unfinished business. In 1996, he almost got the piece to the surface, but a sudden storm forced him to let it drop back down to the deep. And what day are we done with the big piece of preparation? 
Now he's back in the North Atlantic with a team of French oceanographers. Team engineer Pierre Valdi will try once again to raise the big piece using his ingenious lift bag method. This time, five enormous bags, each filled with 6,000 gallons of lightweight diesel fuel. Each bag is capable of bringing three and a half tons to the surface. On the French naval vessel Nadir, the five bags are tied to enormous chains, then dropped to the ocean floor. Then the manned subnautil goes to the bottom to carry those chains and lift bags over to the big piece. David Livingstone goes down in Nautil to watch history. He's in the sub as it makes sure that all the lines to the chains are cut. What up? The lift bags are free, and the big piece should start to rise. But on Nadir's bridge, the news is not good. Computers show the big piece isn't rising. The piece is stuck too deeply in the ocean floor. On paper, this works. On paper, it works. That's correct. In the middle of the North Atlantic? Um, you know, uh, you have to be careful with the ocean, and uh, you, you can't just... Uh, you can't just guarantee things. Two years ago, the big piece was lying on its back on the ocean floor. Now it's straight up, and Livingstone has examined both sides. The plan is to add a sixth lift bag for more pull. There will now be seven tons of thrust tugging at the hull. Everyone waits anxiously on the deer. Suddenly, computers show the lift bags are beginning to rise. A chain surfaces. Okay, enough, enough, enough. The tulloch stops the hoist rope. Divers make a dangerous plunge through lift bags and lift lines and come upon the big piece still in one piece. Forget them, let's go. On the surface, the hoisting begins again. Allé, 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 allé. And slowly, seemingly weighed down by its tragedy, the piece breaks through the surface and into the sunlight for the first time in 86 years. Livingstone isn't on a bay. He couldn't make it over from another ship. At this moment, a tense Tulloch wishes his friend were here. Livingston should be here. David Livingston should have been here. Men on launches move in to strap the big piece so it doesn't swing wildly on the deck. One bad slam into that A-frame and the brittle steel would shatter. The hoisting starts for a third time. The tension is nearly too much for Tulloch. I can't take this, you know. It's completely out of the water now and swinging toward the deck. Come on, where's the rope? Where's the rope? Why isn't this rope tight? Now, okay. But the long bottom end of the piece is giving a bay's crew problems. And as the piece is finally laid onto the deck, the long end bends up dramatically, as if it's the ocean's last comment before giving up one of its rarest prizes. For the team, it is a stunning victory over the North Atlantic. Boy, oh boy, look at that pressicles. A nice piece of deck. And David Livingstone, he sees the piece the next day. For him, the Titanic, pride of Harlan and Wolf, the finest ship ever built by man, is, after 86 years, once again something real. Some of the lessons that were learned from Titanic and have been forgotten. In many cases, uh, the lessons were learned at that time and then were forgotten again, only to, to, to be, have to be relearned at some time in the future. I think it really had to be brought up again. It had to be recovered. And what you're looking at now are live images from Magellan. I take that back from Nautil. This is the outside camera of Nautil. Nautil is continuing its trek around the stern of Titanic. And we will continue with our odyssey on Titanic right after this. Welcome back to our special Discovery Channel presentation with historic live pictures from the wreck of Titanic, two and a half miles on the ocean floor. We go back now live to Sarah James in the North Atlantic on board the research ship Abay. 
Thanks, John. And I am joined by Jack Eaton, a historian who studies Titanic and has for many years. And I want to ask you, we've talked so much about this large piece of Titanic that's been brought back from the deep. Why is it so important to have a piece of Titanic back? This piece, to me, represents Titanic's past and present and future, and I think that's where the true significance of it is. Uh, it's a piece that was uh, fabricated and uh, uh, attached, if you will, to Titanic in 1911. Uh, it was certainly part of the wreck that uh, was at the bottom of the ocean for so many years. Now, thanks to technical skill and dexterity, we have it here. Well, when you talk about technical skill and dexterity, I think about those incredible images that we're getting from Magellan, images of the bow of Titanic, having an opportunity to see those images. That was state of the art then, and yet it's at the bottom of the ocean. Well, just as uh, this represents state of the art today, uh, Titanic represented state of the art before, uh, these pictures from the bottom of our, that we're seeing are absolutely fantastic. I recall five years ago when I dived on the wreck, uh, it was such a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to observe, and we were, uh, we, we were so limited then. And uh, now, thanks to the uh, Magellan and, uh, and Nautil, we have even greater opportunity to uh, observe the uh, things on the bottom of the sea. Well, Jack, we want to, with this incredible technology, take one more opportunity, if we can, to go back to Paul Mathias. Where are you with Nautil right now, Paul? Yeah, hi, Sarah. Hi, Paul. Where are you with Nautil right now? Well, right now, Sarah, we're moving around the outside of the stern. Uh, what we found out here is uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, pieces of debris. Uh, right there, I think uh, you can make out our line, uh, our, our uh, fiber optic line on the uh, on the seabed. Uh, that's what we're using for this live link up and. Uh, uh, I think you got a good view of it there. Uh, we'll be moving down along the side and trying to make our way back into where the uh, uh, main turbine is. The, the main turbine provided uh, uh, some uh, 20,000 horsepower to the Titanic. Quickly, Paul, what would you do if that tether got caught while you were exploring the wreck? Could you cut it off? Well, they intentionally designed it uh, with a breaking strength of about 100 pounds. Um, so we, we could easily break that off. Uh, we'd hate to, uh, hate to do that, but uh, there is quite a lot of debris down here. It could easily get caught up, and uh, it is a possibility. But at the moment, we seem to be making a good connection. You're making an excellent connection, and we hope to be able to return to you once more. But before we do that, we want to look at some more of these incredible images just remarkable that we can be speaking to you from the bottom of the ocean. I keep craning my head over to the side because I want to be taking a look at these amazing images that we have, both from the stern and from the bow, as we look live at the Titanic. The unforgettable images of a great disaster. When we come back, a last look at the astonishing pictures from the mission to the Titanic. For the last two hours, Discovery Channel has been bringing you a special presentation on the mission to solve the mysteries of the Titanic. It was about this time of night in the North Atlantic, 86 years ago, that the mighty ship was nearing its final death throes. Let's go back out one last time to our explorers and experts at the wreck site, and we begin with Sarah James. Thank you, John. As we look at those extraordinary images from the bow of Titanic, we think about now the fact that we have one small piece of her. And Roy Cullimore, I would like to ask you, these rusticles, they are so beautiful. In a way, is this a beautiful way for Titanic to die? 
it's probably a very fitting way for her to die because the rusticles are taking the iron from the elegant lady and they're returning the iron to the ocean and in the ocean that iron will be used by many other organisms to do many things such as fixing carbon dioxide which is a problem we have because of the greenhouse effect so what we have in process is really there is no beginning there is no end there's just the same thing over and over and over again man made the titanic with steel brought from the iron ore and now nature through the rusticles is taking the iron back and giving it to all of the organisms in nature something that is happening at an ever-increasing rate. Dr. Roy Cullimore, thank you so much for your thoughts this evening and for joining us. And I know, Bob, you've been joined by an incredible panel of experts there, too. What are the thoughts there? Well, these people, I think, Sarah, know Titanic as well and intimately and sentimentally as anyone there is. Gentlemen, I'd like to ask you, coming out here year after year to pay your respects, as you have on previous expeditions, when you see the sort of thing we've seen tonight, does it occur to you that sooner or later, probably sooner, you'll have to say goodbye to Titanic for the last time? Yes, it's uh, quite obvious that the decay that uh, I have seen over the last two years has, uh, has been really tremendous. And it's really sad to see how quickly uh, the ship is disappearing and dissolving. If you came back in two years, David, and you're a naval architect, how much more of this would you expect to see? Well, I think we must expect the, uh, uh, the decay to accelerate. Uh, at what rate, uh, we don't really know, but perhaps uh, Dr. Cullimore, his uh, r research will tell us uh, a lot more about that. Yeah, Bill Garski, what about you? Well, one thing I, I got out of this expedition was that the 300-foot uh, the gash is certainly a myth, and that the ship started to break apart at the surface and uh, try to really comprehend the forces that were involved in the final moments of a grand old lady who now perhaps with maybe I, i'm talking with Roy Colomar in about four years will start to show advancing decay for the deck starting to collapse and the sides starting to fall in yeah, and it's rather sad Charlie House, do you think it's possible that many of these Titanic mysteries, the unanswered questions that's brought you back expedition after expedition, will cease to be an issue after a few more years? I think the Titanic is going to live on, but in an altered way. I, I think we're, we're moving beyond the, the physical wreck uh, to the point where the ship is, is mainly existing in our memories. And I think that's one reason why the recovery of the artifacts is so important, because as, as time moves on, those are going to be the only tangible reminders we have of what was once a very beautiful and wonderful ship. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for being part of this magical evening out here in the middle of the North Atlantic. Sarah, I don't know about you, but there are a couple of things which will stay with me for a long time after the weeks we've spent out here, or days which seem like weeks. The first thing, I think, is standing on the deck of this ship and looking out on a, a moonless night but under a brilliant starry sky at essentially what must have been the last thing that 1500 people on titanic saw and it was a very sobering moment knowing that just two and a half miles below us was that ship was the the, the vessel that brought them here to the end of their lives I think another thing that's come out of this is just the respect of all the people who've worked on this expedition. They're the top of their profession, they're the top of their craft, they've come out here in some cases to risk their lives to show us the pictures we've seen tonight, but at the base of it all was an enduring respect for this ship and the passengers and crew who sailed and died on her. And I think it's a very sentimental moment right now for a lot of people. But I think one thing we have done today is give the world some enduring images of Titanic that whatever happens two and a half miles down will live a long time. Sir. Thanks so much, Bob. If I can, I'd like to bring Paul Mathias back just one more time to say thank you for joining us from two and a half miles down. And I'm sure that you have some of these same thoughts as, as, you, as you look at the Titanic at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, I didn't quite catch that uh, last part, Sarah. And that is one of the few times in which the technology has failed us. 
but the fact of the matter is we've been able to carry on a conversation and that is one of the things that I'm going to remember from this night. You know, the other thing for me, Bob, as I reflect back on this is that on Titanic there were more than 2,000 people from more than 40 countries. In many ways, it was like a floating United Nations. And there were on that ship people who were decadently rich, people who were desperately poor. There were socialites and social outcasts. There were people who were famous, and there were people we've forgotten. It was, in so many ways, a crucible, and they were us. And when this armada sails, and this spot is once again invisible in an immense ocean, we'll still know where Titanic is. Because long ago, we plotted her with the latitude and the longitude of our imagination. And it's those images tonight that have sparked our imagination, I think, once again, and really made Titanic our touchstone. John? Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Bob, and our entire team of scientists, explorers, and journalists in the North Atlantic. Of course, this expedition will continue through the end of the month from the site of the Titanic, and we will bring you the latest scientific conclusions from the mission in future programming on Discovery Networks around the world. If you would like to learn more about Titanic and talk online to some of the expedition scientists about their findings, you can log on to our website at www.discovery.com. And we leave you now with more of the unforgettable images from the remarkable mission to the Titanic. I'm John Siegenthaler. Discovery Channel, the raw force of nature as you've never seen it before. Volcanoes, hurricanes, floods, blizzards, and earthquakes. Is it the end of the world? Raging Planet, tomorrow on the Discovery Channel. And right now, a night to remember continues. No actors, no scripts, no special effects. If you missed it the first time, be there this time. We've taken you down, now we're taking you in. Titanic Live, the taped rebroadcast, starting right now on the Discovery Channel.